everybody, Rachel here. Today I'm going to continue to talk about malaria, how we figured out what causes it, how humans have evolved to try to deal with it, and what we can do to try to eradicate it. Last week, I talked about how malaria has been affecting humanity for almost as long as there's been humanity, and also about what causes it and how it manifests. But how did we figure out what causes this horrible disease? Well, in 1880, Charles Laverin, a French army doctor in Algeria, observed the plasmodium parasites inside the red blood cells of people who were sick with malaria and identified them as the cause of the disease. This was the first time that a protozoa was identified as causing disease, and he received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1907 for his work. In 1881, Carlos Finlay, a Cuban doctor who was working on yellow fever in Havana, proved that mosquitoes could transmit disease. And in 1897, Sir Ronald Ross, a Scottish physician, figured out the complete life cycle of the malaria parasite. Ross received the 1902 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work. Weird side note, in the first half of the 20th century, one of the plasmodium species, P. vivax, was actually used in something called malariotherapy, which was deliberately infecting people who were sick with other diseases, such as syphilis, with malarial parasites to try to induce a very high fever to kill off the other infection. This actually did work sometimes, but it also had a fatality rate of 15%. So we don't do that anymore. The first effective treatment for malaria came from the bark of the cinchona tree, which grows in the Andes, mainly in Peru. Jesuit missionaries first brought the cinchona bark back to Europe around 1640, but of course it was rare and expensive. It wasn't until 1820 that the active ingredient was extracted from the bark and isolated. This was quinine. Another weird side note, the cocktail gin and tonic may have been invented as a way to try to make taking quinine, which was very bitter, more palatable. In the 20th century, we developed the medicines chloroquine, which we've all heard of by now, and sulfadoxine pyrimethamine, but the plasmodium parasites developed resistance to both of them in the 1950s and 60s. There are very few places in the world today that have malaria that isn't resistant to chloroquine. Nowadays, the best treatment that we have is something called artemisinin-based combination therapy, or ACT. Artemisinin was discovered in 1972 by a Chinese doctor named Tu Yu Yu who originally isolated it from sweet wormwood, an herb that is used in traditional Chinese medicine. Tu Yu Yu received the 2015 Nobel Prize in Medicine for her discovery, and incidentally, got to see one of my favorite tiaras up close and personal during the Nobel Prize's award banquet. We now use a precursor compound that can be produced by a genetically engineered yeast, which is much more efficient. But unfortunately, the plasmodium parasites are already developing resistance to artemisinin, so the World Health Organization recommends using it only in combination with another medication, such as methoquine, lumefantrine, or sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. Think about the countries where malaria is endemic. How likely is it that they're going to be able to treat with all of these expensive medications? And medicine resistance is just going to get worse. Even now, there are some plasmodium strains that are found on the Cambodia-Thailand border that are resistant to all of our current combination therapies and may be completely untreatable. This is our future. Interestingly, while the parasites have evolved resistance to our efforts to kill them, humans have evolved ways to try to deal with the parasites too. The most famous is sickle cell trait, where some people have a single amino acid substitution in the hemoglobin proteins of their red blood cells, causing the cells to form into a sickle shape. People who are homozygous for the sickle cell allele have sickle cell disease, which causes attacks of severe pain, anemia, 
swelling of the hands and feet, susceptibility to bacterial infection, and stroke. The average life expectancy for people who have sickle cell disease is just 40 to 60 years, even in developed countries. And they need frequent blood transfusions. So if you can, give blood. But people who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele, they have one allele that is normal and another that is sickle. They have resistance to dying from malaria, especially from P. falciparum, the most deadly strain. If you ever have anyone who asks you to give an example of natural selection at work, give them this one. The geographical distribution of the sickle cell allele in Africa and the geographical distribution of malaria in Africa virtually overlap. There are other genetic factors that also confer some resistance to malaria, such as thalassemia, which is decreased hemoglobin production, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, which predisposes the red blood cells to break down, and a genetic absence of something called Duffy antigens on red blood cells. Duffy antigens are the receptors for the parasites P. vivax and P. nolesi. Of course, evolving humans to be resistant to malaria takes way too long, so it would be better if we could prevent malaria transmission. We do have ways to do that. The most effective is actually just putting insecticide-treated nets around people's beds at night. But there's also spraying pesticides to kill mosquitoes outright and poisoning the stagnant water sources or getting rid of them completely to prevent the malaria larvae from growing in them. There are also newer, more subtle methods, such as introducing sterile male mosquitoes into an area so that when the female mosquitoes mate with them, their offspring aren't viable, theoretically reducing the mosquito population in that area, or maybe even getting rid of it completely. All of these methods are being used in the current eradication efforts. Malaria was eradicated from Southern Europe and most of the United States in the early 20th century using treatment of infected humans and vector control programs such as draining of the wetland breeding grounds and other changes in water management practices, advances in sanitation, and the increased use of glass windows and screens. But malaria was still endemic to pockets of the American South until the 1950s, when spraying with DDT finally eliminated it from there. The latest eradication push began in 2006 when a group called Malaria No More set a public goal of completely eliminating malaria by 2015. Of course, that didn't happen, but you can see how difficult this is to do. It's not like smallpox, which is a virus that is transmitted just human to human, and we talked about how difficult that was to do. But instead, we have the five different species of plasmodium that currently affect humans, plus all the other plasmodium species that infect other animals that constantly come in contact with humans and could potentially be a new source of infection. And even if you're just talking about the species that currently infect humans, it's not necessarily enough to just eliminate the disease from humans you always have to be careful about your animal reservoir. In other words, the mosquitoes could always reinfect the humans. It's very, very difficult to eradicate a zoogenic vector-borne disease. We've never done it, but that doesn't and shouldn't stop us from trying. The Malaria Policy Advisory Committee of the World Health Organization was formed in 2012 to provide strategic advice and technical input to WHO and member countries on all aspects of malaria control and elimination. In 2013, they set a goal of developing vaccines designed to interrupt malaria transmission with a long-term goal of malaria eradication. But it's very difficult to develop a vaccine against malaria, partly because of those five different plasmodium species that infect humans, but also because of the polymorphic nature meaning there are different varieties of many of the proteins that are found on the cell membranes of the plasmodium parasites. 
There is a vaccine that is undergoing large-scale testing in several countries in Africa where malaria is endemic. That's the very exciting name of this vaccine. But it's only against P. falciparum, not the other species. It needs four doses and it's only about 40% effective. So the world is going on with the other ways to try to eradicate malaria that I talked about before. And the current target that was set in 2015 is a 90% decrease in the incidence of malaria and a 90% decrease in deaths from malaria by 2030. Even in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization is emphasizing the critical importance of efforts to prevent, detect, and treat malaria. And it is working. Countries that have achieved at least three consecutive years of zero indigenous cases are eligible to apply for WHO certification of malaria elimination. And in the past 10 years, 10 new countries have been certified. The next big push from WHO is to try to completely eliminate malaria from the Mekong region by 2030. The Mekong region is Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Yunnan province in China. All of these countries have national malaria elimination plans. And from 2012 to 2018, there has been a 74% reduction in the incidence of malaria in these countries and a 95% reduction of deaths from malaria. Of course, the big issue is Africa, where most of the malaria cases occur, and that's going to be the difficult one. But we owe it to ourselves and to future generations to try. Eradicating malaria would prevent countless deaths and suffering and allow millions of people to live without the fear of contracting this horrible disease. And this isn't just a problem for people somewhere else to have to deal with. Because the world is getting warmer and the climate is changing drastically in many places, malaria is a problem that we're all going to have to concern ourselves with. Because if we don't do it now, we are certainly going to have to do it later. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, and you think you'll be interested in more videos about public health, click like and subscribe. Thank you. I hope to see you soon.